Saudi Vision 2030 is aiming to diversify Saudi Arabia's economy away from its dependence on oil with a trillion dollar transformational program. That's a big number, isn't it? Talking me through it is David Leslie. Now, David is the General Manager, Global Trade and Receivables Finance at Saudi British Bank. David, it's good to see you. I mean, look, this growth is phenomenal. It's bucking a trend at a time when the rest of the developed world is struggling. There is that possibility of global recession. So what is it beyond oil that's fueling this growth in the kingdom? Well, thank you for the warm introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here. And I, I, certainly, oil is a contributor to the, the, the growth in 2022. But there is a bigger story, as you say, with Saudi Vision 2030. That's the diversification away from oil, trillion dollar investment, as you said. Uh, but you've also got societal change over the last few years, which is quite exciting. Uh, consider, for example, that women are now represent 35% in the workforce. And that's very positive, obviously, for, for, for their, um, their, their freedoms. But also, uh, it, it actually starts certain consumer trends. And take, for example, also a few years ago, uh, women were given the right to drive, and overnight you have a doubling of the potential car market. So there's quite a few things at play in Saudi that makes it quite exciting for opportunities for international clients. Mm. And the big driver, of course, is Saudi Vision 2030. Yes. Now, how would you describe it? What is it? Well, it's a, it's a full transformation program to get off of oil, really. Um, so it touches all parts of society, you know, from education, healthcare, to the technology, energy and water. So it's very comprehensive and has a lot of infrastructure spend, the Giga projects, as well as the aspiration to become a global trade hub. Um, so it's quite comprehensive. You also have uh, overlaid with a lot of ESG ambitions. So it's, it's a very interesting transformative program. Mm, I'm glad you mentioned that word ESG because, look, it is a hot button subject as well, when, regardless of where you are in the corporate world. But for some, the idea that Saudi Arabia could be part of the ESG drive does seem counterintuitive when you look at the fact that most of the wealth is actually based on oil. So how can Saudi reconcile that with its bigger aspirations and with ESG? Because the two seem counterproductive. Yeah, I can understand that sentiment. And I think it's important to note that the IEA under net zero scenarios to 2050, you still have um, a forecast for oil as a large component of uh, global supply. So the emphasis is really on the lowest emissions in production as we transition off of oil. Um, in that regard, Saudi is very well placed because they have the lowest emissions and they're investing further in that space. Um, but they also have a wide breadth of products that well meets uh, global demand. Um, but beyond that, you have the Saudi Green Initiative, um, which is quite exciting. It's a $185 billion investment into several different initiatives uh, in ESG. Uh, for example, they have the, uh, the goal to become the world's largest export of green hydrogen. Green hydrogen. Yes, and it's a very large project in Neom around that space. Um, they also have the goal to, be, to achieve 50% um, renewable, renewable energy by 2030. Uh, so there's quite a bit of new solar coming online in, in Saudi. The Sadair project, for example, is a 1.2 gigawatt installation. Um, and then beyond that, they're planting 10 billion trees, which may also sound counterintuitive because they're a desert. Um, we're talking about mangroves here, which are well suited to the environment of Saudi Arabia, and they're a great sequester of carbon dioxide. Yes, yeah, so the, the Giga projects you referenced there, and also Neom, the line. Yes. Yeah, so tell us a bit more about that. So the Giga projects are very exciting in their own right, but keep in mind they're all running simultaneously. Um, you have the Red Sea Development, for example, which is a major uh, ecotourism uh, build in the west of Saudi Arabia. It's the size, landmass of, of, of Belgium. Um, you have Kadia, which is a major sports entertainment hub in Riyadh. But Neom uh, is really exciting because it's a, a greenfield futuristic city um, that is in the northwest of Saudi Arabia. Uh, and imagine what could be done if you didn't have the legacy infrastructure that most cities are challenged with and the technology and designs of today. So that's Neom. There will be no cars, no roads. Um, and the residents within five minute walk of their doorstep will have everything they need for their day to day life. It's like a self-contained community, basically. Absolutely. Yeah. And the line is 170 kilometers long and you can traverse that in 20 minutes. Um, and they're using autonomous data in a way to really better predict um, the residents' needs so it makes for less friction in your day-to-day -day life. Um, that's the idea. Right. I mean, you've, you've basically explained that trillion-dollar price tag, really, haven't you? Yeah. Because of the <laughs> amount of spending that's going on. But, you know, there, there is that aspiration on the kingdom to be a global trade hub. So how is, it, how is a Saudi trade hub going to be different if you compare it to more established trade hubs in the likes of Dubai yes. and, of course, Singapore? Because they've got the advantage, haven't they? Sure, sure. So I mean, they certainly done a great job with those, those hubs. And I think if you think of Saudi Arabia, if you think of their advantages. So you think of the ge geography of Saudi Arabia, you have the Red Sea on one side, you have the Gulf on the other. The Suez Canal is right there. So they're in a good position to facilitate trade between Europe, Asia and Africa. 
So they're investing heavily now in the infrastructure to make that happen. Um, you know, the ports, uh, roads, there's a new road going through the uh, empty quarter through the Oman. And you've also got something called the land bridge, which is a railway that's going to be going from Jeddah, the Red Sea, connecting right through the Dammam. What that means is you don't need to ship around uh, Saudi Arabia and Yemen and through the Strait of Hormuz. You have a, about a three or four day saving in terms of shipping times. So it's, it's quite efficient that way. But they also recognize it's not just the physical infrastructure that needs to change. It's also the financial systems. Um, so um, banks like Saab and the government are working on kind of reducing the friction in trade um, with new technology and solutions. Do you see Dubai perhaps as, as providing a bit of a model in that sense? Because once upon a time, Dubai was an oil producer in its own right, but it didn't have the finite resources of Saudi Arabia. It had to pivot. It went towards financial services. So could that be a cue as well for Saudi? Absolutely. And I think, you know, if you look at what Dubai did really well, is they created a society around um, their infrastructure where people wanted to live and, and create businesses. And, and that really counted for a lot of the success of Jebel Ali. Um, so I, I think, it, you know, the, the vision of 2030 is transformative. And it's quite exciting, um, especially for international clients looking to be part of that and, and, and that economic boom. And they're certainly moving over there because they can sense the vision as well. So everybody wants to be a part of it. But when it comes to digitization, it's a huge focus in Cybos Week. What are the trends that you're seeing in Saudi Arabia? Do you think that it's actually now getting easier to trade in the kingdom? Have the restrictions lifted in that sense? And is digital making it happen? Yeah, so in trade and banking, you still have a lot of paper in, in trade day to day. So we're working, at, you know, Saab is the largest trade bank in Saudi Arabia. So we're working on really investing in technology to remove, remove the friction and make it easier. Uh, we went live with Contour, which is digital letter of credit, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and what that means is 52 countries now can connect digitally into Saudi through Saab. Uh, but also on guarantees, a lot of these pro projects have a lot of guarantees involved. And when the beneficiary has a paper leg, it's quite um, time consuming for issuance and getting the cancellations back. So we're digitizing the beneficiary leg um, with solutions. We just went live yesterday with one for SEC. And effectively, it takes us off of paper into real-time um, issuance and cancellations. And look, so much happening. And I'm sure that we're going to touch base again for the next Cyborgs yes. so that we can continue the next chapter of the story. Yeah. It will be wonderful. But David, Leslie, thank you so much for joining us at Cyborgs. And enjoy your stay here in Amsterdam. I think that a lot of people will be gravitating around your stall. Look forward to that. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much.